In this video, I'm going to attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sapphire with only purple Pokemon. You can check out my full rule set in the description below, but in short, no items in battle except for held items, no overleveling, and we're playing on set mode. For those of you who don't know, the Pokedex assigns a single color to every single Pokemon in existence, even the ones who clearly have more than one color. And while some of these assignments are questionable at best, this is what I'll be using as my guide for the run, as well as future color-based Nuzlocke. So with that being said, which Pokemon does the Pokedex consider purple? Well as it turns out, there's a decent amount in Gen 3 actually. These are all of my legal encounters for this run. It is worth noting that I cannot use Pokemon such as Skitty, Spoink, Staryu, or Gulpin, who are not purple, until they fully evolve. So while I can get some of these pretty early, they can't be utilized until a bit later. And I think that's it. Will I make it through this run? I don't know, but I can't wait to find out. It's been a while since I've played Sapphire. It feels a little weird after playing so much Emerald recently. Getting right into it, I speed through the normal boring stuff and head straight for starter selection. For this run, I decided to replace Torchic with Grimer as my starter, and I did this for a few reasons. Firstly, I picked Grimer because both he and Coughing have the same encounter location in the Fiery Path, and I wanted to be able to use them both. Yes, it would have been harder if I could only use one of them, but then it wouldn't be as fun, and having less fun is dumb. I also replaced Torchic so that our rival would have Mudkip, who would probably give us the most trouble out of the three starters since quite a few of our Pokemon will be poison. This should be interesting though. I can't remember the last time I used a Grimer. I head out and quickly dispose of our rival. Grimer stats are actually pretty similar to Mudkip's, but they are better distributed, honestly. Although the lack of speed might become a big issue for us down the road. Once I get through the intro of the game, it's time to start trekking towards gym number one. This is going to be one of the most difficult parts of the whole run, honestly, as the only two encounters I can get up to Roxanne are Cascoon and Skitty. Yeah. I can't use Skitty until it evolves, and Cascoon can't attack. <laughs> Although, come to think about it, my Grimer does have Poison Gas, and so maybe Cascoon can harden up and take a few hits while Roxanne's Pokemon slowly go down. We'll have to see how it goes. Since Grimer will be the only primary Pokemon I've got for a while, not to mention I won't be able getting Muck until after Winona, I thought it would be wise to do some EV training before I continue. And as much of a slog as that's going to be, with the limited amount of encounters I do have, it's probably worth it. Since speed isn't exactly his strong suit, I decided to go with attack and HP to add both some damage and some needed bulk. So I'll be killing a lot of Poochiana and Wurmple slash Wismer during the run. <laughs> After helping Wally catch his first Pokemon, I head over to Petalburg Woods to pick up the second encounter of the run, Cascoon. Unfortunately, it will also remain a Cascoon for the rest of the run, as Dustox is not considered to be a purple Pokemon. Even though this thing can't attack, I think it may still be able to find some use, at least early on. I may have to consider that option, as I won't get another usable encounter until after the first badge. From here, I handle the usual early game slog by saving a helpless adult, grabbing the TM for Bullet Seed, a free Person Berry, which is very nice, grabbing the Quick Claw, and then heading north to Route 116 for some grinding before Roxanne, and our next encounter, Skitty. I can't believe I just went through the trouble of obtaining an awful Pokemon with a 2% encounter rate, and I can't even use it until at least the third gym badge. Actually, it's after the third gym badge. It's even worse. It feels a little bad. And off to the box you go, little guy. And now, we're finally at Roxanne. The idea here is going to be to take down Geodude as quickly as I can with Sludge, and then attempt to poison Nose Pass as soon as it comes out. I can then use either Harden to try and stall him out, or I can just go for some more Sludges. We'll see how much damage he can deal to us. We can also use Cascoon to stall for a bit as well. Let's see what she's got. I go for the Sludges right away, and very quickly notice that it deals so much less damage than I thought it would. Oh god. I mean, I knew ground resisted poison, but I... Totally forgot that rock resisted poison too, which makes this extremely bad. Luckily the first one hits a poison, but this is going to be a very rough fight. I start building up Hardens to max up my defense as much as possible in the hopes that it'll be enough to hold on. I'm gonna have to get pretty goddamn lucky if I'm gonna win this <laughs> at all. This battle with Geodude was very stressful. It came down to the absolute wire and I had to avoid getting a crit a single time in order to get through it. Grimer levels up during the fight and so I gain some HP back, but not much. 
Luckily for me, this AI is trash and Nosepass decides to go for Harden on his first turn. And Grimer's Poison Gas hits with 55% accuracy. I switch out Grimer for Cascoon, hoping that he'll survive for a few turns of poison damage. But a single rock throw brings him down. I send Grimer back in, and while the first rock throw missed, the next one didn't. Bringing our starter down and giving us our first wipe of the run. I'm gonna have to come up with something else for Roxanne in the next attempt. Although, it's looking to be pretty tough and completely reliant on luck. For this attempt, I decided to actively avoid as many trainers as I could, so I could EV train in Grimer's HP stat as much as I possibly could, to give myself the best chance. Otherwise, nothing really is all that different. I picked up the other two encounters, boxed Skitty, did what grinding I could, and headed back to the first gym for attempt number two. I'm going to try a similar strategy here, but I'm also going to incorporate Disable into the mix. Not sure if it'll help much, but disabling Rock Throw would force them to use the less accurate Rock Tomb instead. We'll see. I opened up with another successful Poison Gas, which is really good. Now let's hope this Geodude presses Defense Curl a million times. The fight pretty much went like the first one did, with the expected back and forth. A miss here and there, but Disable did help a lot here at least. As it turns out, Roxanne will not use Rock Tomb if my Pokemon's speed is lower than hers. This is absolutely huge and will save a lot of damage on Grimer against Nosepass. Geodude eventually goes down and Grimer's level up puts him at 20 HP. Nosepass comes out and I miss my first poison gas, but I do hit the second one at least. Nosepass's attack stat is so much worse than Geodude's, and that is going to be the key if I'm going to get through this somehow. I'm able to get a disable off on Nosepass's rock throw, which forces him to use tackle instead. This is going to be crazy close. But finally, a stroke of luck. Sludge crits and Nosepass falls finally giving us the first gym badge of the run. Holy crap, that was rough. Hopefully things will become a little easier as I'm able to pick up some more encounters. Fresh off my first gym badge, I help some more adults, hop on a boat to Duford, and immediately head to Granite Cave for our next usable encounter. I'm on the first basement floor here because there's a 10% chance I run into Sableye, which would be much better than Zubat right now. And after a couple of wild Pokemon, we get the Sableye. Holy crap, that's huge. Sableye is going to be a vital member of the team, especially against the upcoming challenges in Brawly, Rival 3, and Watson. He's a super crazy game changer for sure in this situation. Ghost types are always super useful, but Sableye also doesn't have any weaknesses and has a ton of great support options. After picking up my new encounter, I finish Mr. Stone's little quest and head all the way back to Rustboro to pick up that experience share. And while I'm here, I take some time to train up Sableye and Cascoon in Wismer Cave to grant some HP EVs before Brawly. Now that I'm all trained up, it's already time for Brawly in the second gym. This one should be very straightforward with virtually no chance of losing thanks to Sableye's immunity to fighting type moves. Machop is first and I start going for some Nightshades. After the second one, I went for an Astonish to try to avoid a potion and it worked out. Machop falls and out comes Brawly's ace, Makuhita. I start going for Nightshades again and forgot that Makuhita can actually hit me in Sapphire version with Knock Off, which he doesn't have an Emerald. But since Knock Off is a dark type move and dark type moves are special in generation three, it basically doesn't do any damage. After a potion, a couple more attacks, and Brawly is finished, giving us an easy second badge. The TM for bulk up is also very nice and could definitely come in handy at some point, as long as someone on the team can actually learn it. With Brawly out of the way, it's time to head over to Slayport to continue our journey. I pick up the usual items on the beach, battle some people, and pick up some delicious soda pop. Now on to completing our quest in the museum, deliver the goods to Captain Stern, and deal with these absolute lunatics. <laughs> And just like that, it's time to head north and pick up our next encounter in Gulpin. Unfortunately, like Skitty, I won't be able to use this little guy until after the third gym badge when he can actually evolve. Which really sucks by the way, because Yawn would have been an amazing tool against Watson's Magneton, and that's yet another encounter I can't use on one of the tougher gyms in this game. Oh well. At least if and when I do get past Watson, Swallet will be an awesome addition to the team. If you've seen my runs where I've used him before, you know how much I love him. I quickly train up for Rival 3, run some damage calculations, and try to come up with the cleanest way possible of dealing with Marsh Top in particular. Oh boy, here we go. I lead with Grimer and start setting up some minimizes, hoping that Shroomish will miss some attacks. While Shroomish does miss the stun spores, the Leech Seed hits, which means I've gotta take this thing out quickly. 
Luckily, Sludge deals just enough to kill in one hit, and now Marsh Tom comes out. I need this poison cast to hit here. And shockingly, she goes for the bide. Holy crap, I'm so lucky. Thank god for this terrible AI. Poison gas hits as well, and since Marsh Tom is locked into bide, I can get a free switch into Sableye, which is amazing. Sableye leads with fake out to get some extra damage and poison in, and then I start going for nightshades. Marsh Tom does hit us with a mud shot, which lowers our speed just enough so that he goes first on the next turn, and then hits us with water gun. Marsh Tom does finally go down, and our berry pops giving us some very neat HP back for the Numble. Now it's just a race to see if my Nightshades can beat out this Numble's Embers. And Sableye pulls through, avoiding the crit and taking down Rival 3. That was very close. Too close, honestly. I'm gonna need to make sure I spend some more time carefully EV training my Pokemon from this point on so I can give myself a little more room for error. Right now it feels like if I make one single mistake I'm just dead. Finally made it to Mauville, which always feels so nice. So much more game opens up here before the third gym, but especially afterwards. Getting through Watson will really open up the world in our encounters. I grind through the typical Mauville related stuff, brutally kill Wally's Pokemon we helped Kim catch. Now, I gamble until I practically drop dead so I can make enough coin to buy the TM for Flamethrower. There's a chance I could make it through Watson without it. I mean, this is Sapphire, not Emerald, but with a challenge like this, it's probably best that I don't take any chances. And no, I'm not gonna tell you how long it took me to do this, but I can tell you that I don't think I will ever do it again. <laughs> Alright, after that traumatizing experience, I finally have the TM for Flamethrower, and have taught it to Grimer. That should hopefully make Watson much safer. Like I mentioned before, once we get past Watson, the encounters we can use really start to get a lot better. Before we take on Watson though, we actually get another encounter on Route 117 in Illumise. In a normal hardcore Nuzlocke challenge, this encounter is awful, generally speaking. And don't get me wrong, Illumise is still not great, but with the limited encounters we can receive in this run, Illumise actually does get some pretty good coverage options, and we could really use them. And there's some utility in there as well, with stuff like Encore and Charm, if we can find use for that. You know what, actually, looking at this thing's stats, it's actually got serviceable special attack and speed. Okay, I see you Illumise. I'm not going to level him up for Watson, I think, because he won't really be super useful with his current moveset, and I want to save his EV training for Route 113, which is the best spot to farm for special attack. After a little more training, I'm ready to take on Watson with Sableye and Grimer. Except I'm not. While strategizing and preparing for this fight, I thought I was going to have an easier time considering that I have Flamethrower now. But after looking at the actual damage calculations, which I should have done ahead of time, I became very, very sad. Flamethrower doesn't even two-shot Magneton, or one-shot Magnemite for that matter. Magneton two-shots both Grimer and Sableye with Shockwave, and they are both of course slower than Magneton. This is actually a disaster. I'm gonna need a new strategy if one even exists for me at this point. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think this is possible. After thinking about it for a very long time, I came up with a strategy that might just be insanely crazy enough to work here. It's the only hope I have anyway. Unfortunately for me, it's going to involve this place again. Yep, I literally said I would never do this again, and here I am, one minute later, doing it again. I need to farm up the coins for Thunderbolt so I can teach that to Illumise. It's not going to be great, but it's a hell of a lot better than using Tackle, that's for sure. I'm also going to need to level up my Illumise and EV train it as much as possible as well, if I'm going to have a shot at this. God, I hope this works. <laughs> so here's a very loose version of the plan I'm going for. Grimer is going to lead this fight and try to take out both Magnetite and Voltorb if he can. That will keep the others healthy enough for Magneton, hopefully. Sableye is going to be an extra support in the back with Nightshade. It very well may come down to him. Illumise is going to be taking on Magneton. Yes, you heard that correctly. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to go. But there is a chance, considering that Magneton will only deal about a third, maybe slightly more of my HP and damage with Shockwave. And while my Thunderbolt will only deal about 15% to Magneton, I'm faster and I have Moonlight for self-healing. Will I have enough heals to push through? Will I get a Paralysis from Thunderbolt? Can I get Magneton low enough where I can finish 
finish him off with a Nightshade from Sableye? Will this actually work at all? Probably not, honestly. But let's find out. I lead with Grimer and immediately start going for flamethrowers. It looks like him and Magnemite are speed tied, which is super annoying. The first supersonic misses and the first flamethrower lands, and then Watson goes for the confuse again and misses again. That is absolutely huge for us with a clean team going into Voltorb. That's the kind of luck that we need. Voltorb comes out, gives me a quick sonic boom, and I go for flamethrower. When I guess I should have just gone for sludge instead, fortunately for us, it didn't end up mattering because my quick claw doesn't proc and Voltorb decides to explode anyway. Luckily, Grimer holds on. That EV training and HP really paid off here. This is exactly where I want it to be for Magneton. Watson's ace finally comes out and I switch into Cascoon so that I can get a clean switch into Illumise. And now, we go to war. Magneton immediately goes for a Thunder Wave Supersonic combo and gets it. Not looking good so far. But Illumise does manage to get through most of the confused turns and Magneton goes for Sonic Boom instead of Shockwave. My Thunderbolt goes off and I get the Paralysis, which is exactly what I need to get through this fight. Holy crap, that's insane. Now, the question is, who will be the lucky one here? Who will get paralyzed more? Back and forth between Thunderbolt and Healing with Moonlight. Moonlight may only have 5 PP, but I do have a Lepaberry equipped to get that PP back if I need it. You'll notice I'm trying to take him down just a little bit more with Quick Attack so I can get him in range of Sableye's Nightshade. And I think I'm in range now, but I don't think it's a good idea to switch directly into Sableye because Magneton can easily two-hit KO him with Shockwave, which means a crit would be the end of this. I make a really rough decision here and decide to sacrifice Grimer to ensure that Sableye can get a clean hit on Magneton. But Magneton went for Supersonic instead and missed! Holy shit, how did we win this fight? This is impossible. I haven't been nuzlocke for that long, but still, I cannot think of a more insane fight that I have ever had against any boss fight in this game. I am truly baffled by this. I should not have won that fight. I mean, we do lose Cascoon in the process, but that's fine because he was never going to evolve anyway, and now we get to take Gulpin and Skitty out of the box and evolve them, adding two more extremely viable team members for the rest of the run. And we've got more encounters coming up. A lot more. The game really opens up at this point, and I'm really excited for what's to come now. I'm going to do everything I possibly can not to lose this run at this point, because I am not sure I can get that lucky again. Okay, time to take a deep breath now. Now onto all the new things I mentioned a minute ago. I picked up the HM for strength and worked on EV training some HP again for Sableye and Grimer. Much easier now that I have the Macho Brace to speed that up a lot. Afterwards, it's time to head north to the Fiery Path, where I can pick up my next encounter in that coughing I mentioned earlier. Coughing is pretty interesting. It gets very, very good coverage, although it is mostly special coverage, which Weezing isn't exactly the best at. Also, why do Coughing and Grimer evolve so goddamn late in these games? It just sucks. I won't have Muck or Weezing until Tate and Liza, which is probably their worst matchup in the whole game. But still, Weezing does have some pretty great stats. It gets Levitate, which makes it immune to ground, and that will be very important for Venona potentially. And he does get some utility in Smokescreen if I need it, and Haze, which might come in handy against all the Dragon Dance and Double Team users. Heading up north, I trek through Route 113, say hi to Lynette, pick up the TM for Dig, which will be incredibly helpful for Flannery, and guess what? Yep, that's right, more EV training. <laughs> I'm getting pretty close to wrapping that up though, for most of my Pokemon at least. For a challenge like this, it's definitely worth it. But now, it's time for another encounter within Meteor Falls. None other than Zubat. This is a huge encounter for us, as Crobat is just great, just in general. Typing is fantastic defensively, super fast, which is very needed on this team currently, and will overall just be a good team member for the rest of the run. Afterwards, we deal with the usual Meteor Falls shenanigans, pick up the Moonstone so we can finally evolve Skitty whenever we want to, and then trek all the way back towards the Fiery Path to scale Mount Chimney and face off against Archie and Team Aqua. This is what I've got going on before I face off against Archie. I took some more time to train up, and you'll see that I've already got my Crobat pretty much ready to go. Just need a few more levels. Skitty is chilling in the box right now, because honestly, it won't be very useful for Flannery anyway, at least not as much as the others. Plus, I'll be getting yet another encounter after this fight, so Skitty is pretty much going to be a backup for the rest of the run. Now on to Archie. And usually there's not much to see here, but this one actually scared me a few times. I sent in Crobat versus Mightyena, and actually had a rough time 
time with that attack drop and the sand attacks. With the super potion on Mightyena, I just wasn't going to get through without switching, so I sent out Grimer next to take out Mightyena. In the process though, Grimer got beat up pretty badly. I also wasted a lot of Orin Berries on this fight. Golbat comes out now and I go for a flamethrower just for some extra damage before I have to switch out. Golbat does get a crit but luckily it wasn't enough to bring Grimer down. I sent in Sableye to finish the job and after some back and forth he was actually able to pull it off. But I did have a pretty rough time with this one as well, especially with the super potion. Finally we have Sharpedo and after another wasted Orin Berry I send in Illumise to bring Archie and his Sharpedo down. I was actually kind of surprised I moved first there? I thought for sure I was going to have to risk a crit from a crunch on that turn. At least we've made it through the fight deathless once again, but I have a feeling that Flannery will be a little bit more difficult to plan for. Before I go ahead and do that though, I actually get yet another encounter while traveling down the Jagged Pass in Spoink. This is another pretty great encounter as I could really use some more type diversity. It's just been mostly poison Pokemon up to this point. You get Grumpig at level 32 and he is basically just a worse Scardivore slash Alakazam, but definitely serviceable. Having another special attacker who is also especially bulky is definitely a plus, but it is a shame that he can't learn Thunderbolt. I can give him Calm Mind though, for some potential setup strats later on in the game. After catching everyone up to speed, it's time to take on Flannery and her fire types. Here's the plan. You'll notice right off the bat that I've brought Delcaddy instead of Sableye, and unfortunately that's because I forgot that the level cap for Flannery and Sapphire is 28 and not 29 like an Emerald. Not a big deal at least, the rest of the team should do just fine, and Delcaddy does get to play a role here. I'm leading with Grimer because with all that Eevee training and attack, Dig is actually a guaranteed one hit KO against both Slugmas, and it should actually be faster than them as well, which is very rare to say for a for a Grimer. And then there's just Torkoal to deal with. I'm expecting Sunny Day to be up by the time I reach Torkoal, so that overheat is going to pack a punch. Luckily, I've got a very nice special wall in Swalla to deal with that. Even in the sun, overheat should only deal around 50% of Swalla's HP, and Torkoal doesn't hold the white herb in Sapphire, so a special attack will go down immediately after using it. From there, I'll put him to sleep and then switch into coughing to start laying down some smoke. When Torkoal wakes up, I'll poison him and then switch into Delcaddy. At this point, Torkoal will be dealing half damage with Overheat. She'll be poisoned, she'll have reduced accuracy and the icing on the cake. Delcaddy's gonna give her an offer she can't refuse. Crobat and Illumise are just here in case something goes wrong and I need a switch. Let's get into it. Starting off the fight, and the only thing that actually goes as expected is dealing with these Slugmas with Grimer. The Sunny Day comes out as expected so that Overheat from Torkoal will pack a punch. After the two Slugmas go down with Dig, I switch into Swallet to take the incoming Overheat. Except, Torkoal misses the Overheat, and so I go for an Amnesia instead just to get some extra bulk in. I mean, why not? Then I go for the Yawn so I can start wailing on him. The Overheat now comes out, but it's out of the Sun, which reduces his damage by so much. After some more back and forth, Torkoal pops my Orenberry and I pop Flannery's first Hyper Potion. I go for Yawn again on the free turn, and then I accidentally pressed Yawn again, but luckily Overheat does nearly nothing now and Torkoal goes back to sleep. I get some more damage in before he wakes up, and after taking a pretty bad body slam, I finally switch into Coughing. I land the Poison Gas right off the bat, Overheat does way more than I thought it would, and my dumbass forgot that Torkoal has the ability White Smoke, which prevents enemy stat drops. I have faced Flannery so many times, and I swear to you, I forget that every single time. I send in Grimer next because Torkoal is now at a minus six special attack, and Dig is going to be the move that not only deals the most damage, but it also gets an extra tick or two of poison damage off. And eventually, Torkoal finally goes down, and the fourth badge is ours. That fight did not go as expected at all. It's funny because that seems to happen a lot despite all the calculations and preparations I put into these fights. I guess I shouldn't be complaining about my deathless Flannery run though. I take Sableye back out of the box to replace Coughing for now, and I head over to the desert.
There are some pretty great items here, including a couple of Stardust for some extra cash, but the real reason we came here is to pick up a surprising encounter in Lilip. Unfortunately, Lilip may be purple, but its evolution in Cradilly is not, so we'll be stuck with the base form. To be honest though, it's not that bad. It's got decent defenses, and if the toxic TM I'm gonna pick up in a minute doesn't make sense for anybody else, it might just work for Lilip if I can beef him up a bit. I'm actually really interested to see how it can hold up against the second half of the game. After training up everyone else on the team, it's time to approach Norman, the leader of the 5th gym. I'm a little nervous about this one, as the only way I'm taking down those slackings is via poison, and Facade is just going to hit extremely hard after that point. Plus, I don't have the best of teams when it comes to physical defense, so this will be challenging. Leading the way is Lilip, who is ironically the bulkiest Pokemon physically on my entire team. Lilip is going to go for Toxic and Confuse Ray primarily, and then take an additional attack from Norman's first slacking, and then finally switching into Sableye on his off turn. Sableye will be taking the first slacking out with a combination of Fake Out and Detect to stall him out. I made sure to equip a Leopard Berry here so that Sableye can restore his Detect PP when it runs out. Sableye will also aid in taking out the second slacking as well, although it may not be able to completely finish the job on its own, as it'll probably run out of Detect PP and Health. Sableye is also a fantastic pivot Pokemon on this fight, being immune to most of the attacks that Norman's Pokemon have. I'm going to try to get as many clean switches as I can. Swallet's sole responsibility is going to be landing a Toxic on that second slacking. Outside of that, he really can't do much else here, but he may be able to take one extra hit for some more poison damage. Crobat will be responsible for taking out Vigoroth with Confuse Ray and Wing Attack. A basic job, but someone's gotta do it. Delcaddy and Illumise are both here to aid Crobat by getting some charms off on Vigoroth first keeping Crobat as healthy as possible. I could also try to land some charms on either of the slackings as well, using Sableye as the perfect pivot to assist with this. Team's ready. Let's do this. I open up with Lilip, apply a quick Toxic, Slacking goes for Yawn, and then I go for Confuse Ray. So far, so good. And I have a Chesto Berry equipped as well to avoid the sleep altogether. This will hopefully make Lilip useful again later on in the fight. I switch into Sableye during Slacking's off turn and go for a single Fake Out, which actually brings Slacking down and conserves my Detect PP as well, which is absolutely huge. Vigoroth comes out, and I know it's going to go for either Encore or Faint Attack since Sableye is immune to its other attacking moves. This allows me to pretty safely switch into Illumina who I will use to land some charms on Vigoroth to try to make him a little less dangerous. Slash does have an increased crit ratio though, which will carve through the stat drops. I'm actually a bit surprised that I'm faster here. I thought for sure Vigoroth would have, have me in speed, but I guess it was close. He then goes for a facade instead, and ironically gets the crit for that instead of Slash, bringing Illumise down to just 1 HP. The EV training and HP really paid off there. That could not be understated. I start going for Moonlights in the hope that I don't get crit for a second time. This would allow me to continue to use Illumise later on in the fight if I wanted to, but to be honest, it probably wasn't worth it in the end. I had Del Caddy anyway, who was another charm user, and with only one Pokemon left after his Vigoroth and Leap at full health, I think I'm in pretty good shape here. After a lot of back and forth, I sent in Crobat to take out Vigoroth one on one. The advantage I hope to have here is to have Vigoroth go down without Crobat taking a whole lot of damage. That way, when the second slacking eventually comes in, Crobat can still take a hit and apply a Confuse Ray if needed. Norman's ace finally comes into battle. I'm expecting Facade or Focus Punch here, so I took the opportunity to pivot using Sableye. It works perfectly, and now that Slacking is on its off turn, I can cleanly switch back into Lilip to go for another Toxic setup. However, this was a big mistake. Naturally, Slacking is going to go for the Focus Punch because it's super effective against Lilip's rock typing. And even though I landed the Toxic, Lilip gets absolutely destroyed by this Slacking's fist. I could have easily switched into Swallet there instead, and maybe Slacking wouldn't have been able to do as much. Much. I might have been risking a crit in that situation, but I would rather take that than basically guaranteeing the loss of a team member. Damn. And I was actually kind of excited to see what Leap can do for the rest of the run, but now he won't have the chance. Rest in peace, buddy. You did a phenomenal job on this fight, and this badge is for you.
After the fight, I pick up the HM for Surf, and now for a second time, the Hoenn region really starts to open up again. I can work on evolving Spoink now into Grumpig, although I still won't have Muck or Weezing until after Winona. And on top of that, I only have one last encounter left to obtain in the game, and I won't be able to get that until way after Winona either. Actually, I think after Tate and Liza as well. Which kinda sucks, because it would've been amazing to have for Winona as well. I'll have to find a different way to get through her. I've got a lot of routes to cover now, but honestly not a whole lot of levels to get before Winona, so I'm not going to be running into a whole lot of trainers on purpose until after I beat her and the level cap becomes much wider. Since no one on my team can learn Surf, I have to catch an HM slave to use it for now. I'll have my water type later in the game. On the way to Fortree City, I pick up the TMs for Ice Beam and Thunderbolt, and with the amulet coin I grabbed from my mom, I'll look to make enough to pick up some more TMs from the Mauville game corner later, because I am not fucking gambling a third time. There's there's not a whole lot else to see here, honestly. This part of the game can be a bit of a slog for sure, especially between Winona and Tate and Liza. So let's skip over most of that and get straight to the good stuff. I go through routes 118 and 119, wiping out the Weather Institute quest, taking down our rival, and making my way past Fortree City so I can meet up with Steven to move the story forward. As I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of accessible routes at this point, but my Pokemon are getting very close to the level cap now, so I'll need to wait on battling all of these trainers for some extra cash for now. Winona, as always, is going to be a tough obstacle to get through with what I've got so far, but I think it can be done. Let's take a look at what we have now. Crobat is leading the way this time, and he's really here mostly to deal with Swellow, and as a pivot if I need to scoot around Altaria's earthquakes. Next is Illumise, who will play a big part in my strategy against that Altaria. She has one job and one job only, Encore. Just one Encore on Dragon Dance, and that's all I want, but I do unfortunately risk Altaria using another move, so I'm not not exactly sure how that's going to pan out yet. I also gave her a quick claw to improve my odds of pulling that Encore off. Once Altaria is locked into Dragon Dance or something else that's less optimal, I'll immediately switch into Delcaddy who will go for Ice Beam until Winona's Ace falls. From there, Grumpig will be used to take out Pelipper, as Pelipper is more physically bulky, so Grumpig should be favored there, and Coughing will be used to face off against Skarmory. I like this matchup, because Coughing is physically bulky and Skarmory only has physical moves. The Metal Chicken also comes with Sand Attack, which I can then just use Haze to fix that problem. Swallet is bringing up the rear, and will be used for backup for anyone that needs help with their assignments. The absolute crucial moment here is going to be landing that Encore with Illumise and dodging a crit in the process. Let's see if we can do this. I open up with Crobat and immediately begin to hurl sludge bombs at Swellow. Swellow does get a double team off and Winona heals her up. Luckily, the double team ended up not mattering at all and with a few more sludge bombs, Swellow goes down and Crobat is still healthy. I keep Crobat in against Pelipper, because why not at this point? And although Pelipper's supersonic slash protect combo is super annoying at times, it goes down as well and Crobat is still very healthy and not showing any signs of slowing down. Man, Crobat is so good. After Skarmory comes out, I throw out a Confuse Ray just to make things a little harder for Winona, and then I switch into Coughing. After taking some damage, Coughing is able to bring Skarmory down with a few Thunderbolts, including a lucky Paralysis proc. And yeah, ignore that accidental sludge bomb, I was going a bit too fast there, but luckily it didn't matter. Really can't afford to make mistakes like that though in the future. Altaria finally comes out, and now it's time to see if we can get that Encore. After taking the first Dragon Breath, Ilimize actually pulls off the Quick Claw proc and lands the Encore on Dragon Breath, which honestly, I'm not that upset about. This allows me to sneak in a Charm before switching into Delcaddy to try to take him out with Ice Beams. Unfortunately, it was a short Encore, but Altaria goes for Dragon Dance first, leaving the door open. After another Dragon Breath, which I assume is because of the attack drop from Charm, Delcaddy lands another Ice Beam through Paralysis, and Fortree's graceful gym leader is defeated. That was a pretty interesting battle, definitely not what I was expecting. Surprisingly clean for the most part as well, at least cleaner than I thought it would be. This is another big milestone for sure, as now I can finally evolve our starter into Muck and coughing into Weezing, and I will soon be able to pick up our last and definitely the best encounter. Very excited for the rest of the run. Moving on to the Great Slog, as I like to call it, I move through the areas and trainers on Routes 120, then a bit on 121, hello Route 122, and Route 123 where I could pick up some nice items, but I unfortunately cannot get the TM for Giga Drain, as I'm not allowing 
the use of any Pokemon outside of my encounters, and Pokemon that are absolutely required for HMs. I stop by Lily Cove City real quick to take care of our rival one last time, and then I head over to Mount Pyre to progress through the story some more, picking up some more items along the way. It is at this point that I now have both Muck and Weezing, which is awesome. Looking at these stats now is just beautiful, and both of them should be infinitely more helpful now moving forward. Time to crash Captain Stern's interview, watch Archie run away, and then follow his ass all the way back to ah, the Aqua Hideout where nothing eventful ever happens. They really should have made these grunts just a bit more challenging. I mean, come on, like, no Golbats? No Sharpedos? I, I don't know. And now, the vast sea of the Hoenn region opens up. Insert joke about how there's too much water in Hoenn here. I spent a little while taking out all the trainers I could, so I would earn enough money to purchase more of those very sought-after TMs in Mauville's game corner. Those will be very helpful later on, especially for the League. After some extra training at the daycare to top everyone else off, it's time to head over to Moss Deep City and take on the 7th Gym. I'm feeling a lot more confident at this point in the game, especially with everyone finally fully evolved. It is nothing like like what we were dealing with before with Roxanne and Watson. Here's what we got for Tate and Liza. Sableye and Grumpig are going to be the primary members of our team and should cause the Psychic Twins a ton of problems. Sableye is incredible for this fight in a few ways. His typing first and foremost, being immune to Psychic, which is always helpful, but he's also fantastic offensively as well, having just learned Shadow Ball right before the level cap. I'll be using Sableye to take down Lunatone first at the bare minimum, but I would not at all be surprised if he assisted in taking down Solrock as well. Next is Grumpig, and Grumpig will be pressing Light Screen and then Magic Coat and that's basically it. The light screen alone is just super powerful here, especially considering half of my team is of the poison variety. Every other member of the team, including Crobat, Delcaddy, Swallet, and Muck, are basically all backups and will function as all-out attackers. If any of them need to come in, it'll be to use whatever move will hit the hardest, and that's it. I know that's not exactly the most elegant or interesting strategy, but I mean, come on. They only have two Pokemon. Tate and Liza are upon us. Let's earn that seventh badge. And the mistakes continue, and I'm super dumb once again. Not only do I not know what the fuck Magic Code does apparently, but I also forgot to teach Grumpig Light Screen right before the fight. I should have noticed it in the team review, but nope. Anyway, turns out I'm still never punished as Lunatone goes for the Hypnosis on Grumpig after I use the Magic Coat and falls asleep in the process, and Soul Rock just goes for Sunny Day. <laughs> Jesus Christ, how, how many more times am I going to get away with this? Sableye has absolutely no issues at all dumpstering both Pokemon with Shadow Ball, and Grumpig is especially tanky enough to take all of the sun-boosted flamethrowers because Solrock isn't really set up to be a great special attacker to begin with. Man, this fight was weird, and I didn't have to switch into anything else at all, but hey, the seventh badge is ours, as well as the TM for Calm Mind, which will probably be taught to Grumpig. It is at this moment though that we can now catch our final encounter of the run and evolve it. I quickly grab the super rod from the kind man inside this house, head to the shore in Lily Cove, and reel in a star you. Oh man, does this one feel good. Starmie is an absolute game changer in any game. Great stats, great ability if you get natural cure at least, which I didn't, but that's okay. And the moveset is just unbelievable. Very important team member that can make the upcoming challenges just a little bit easier to prepare for. An absolute juggernaut. After training up our final team member, I head over to the seafloor cavern to deal with the clown show and pick up the TM for Earthquake in the process. Would have been a really great pickup, but come to find out, none of my Pokemon can learn it. So it kind of sucks, I guess. And after dealing with the calamity outside and wrapping up the remainder of the story-related things, we are already at the 8th gym. I remember that segment taking a lot longer than that, but maybe I've just been playing too much Emerald recently. And the battle with Archie, by the way, really wasn't even worth showing here. My team just absolutely destroyed him. Team is leveled up, and I'm ready to break it down for Wallace. Our new toy is bringing up the front on this one, and I'm thinking Starmie is just going to wreak absolute havoc on most of Wallace's team. Thunderbolt for everything except for Whisk Cash and Recover to stay alive longer. For Wallace's Ace Milotic, I'm going to try to go for the Poison Stall strat, starting with Swallet. Swallet has a ton of special bulk on him, so I shouldn't have any problem getting off a single Toxic. This will increase Milotic's physical defense by 50% due to its Marvel Scale ability, but since we're going for Stall, that really doesn't matter. Sableye will of course be used to help our Stall strategy a bit. He may not be able to get the job done completely as he won't be able to take too many hits, but he should still be able to get a few turns in. 
Both Grumphig and Muck are also specially bulky and should be able to take a few more hits from Milotic as well if they need to. Otherwise, they will just be used to help star me out with the rest of the team. And Crobat is pretty much fulfilling the same role. I went with Crobat instead of Delcaddy or Illumise just because he's so much bulkier and faster at this point in the game. Confuse Ray could potentially come in handy, whereas Charm really won't help as much on this fight. Seven badges down, just one more to go. I lead with Starmie, and it just starts running over Wallace's Pokemon. It was honestly kind of ugly to watch. I almost felt bad for him. Love Disk and Whiskash go down very easily, and then after Celio comes out, since it can't do a whole lot to me, I just pop a Recover and then go to wipe him out as well. Sea King posed the biggest threat and the scariest moment overall for the whole fight, honestly, as he actually went for a Horn Drill. Which, for those of you who don't know, Horn Drill is a highly inaccurate move at just 30%, but if it lands, it will KO my Pokemon regardless of health. Luckily, the 30% doesn't matter, and Starmie goes on to wipe out the other Celio as well. Wallace's notorious ace finally comes out and I send out Grumpig first to set up a light screen to help out. I'm not really sure if I even needed it honestly but I decided last minute that it might just be helpful just in case especially with rain currently up. And after that Milotic really isn't dealing a whole lot anymore. I switch into Swallet next to put up that Toxic and Milotic does get a crit but my Citrus Berry pops, Toxic finally lands and now it's time to stall. And apparently I didn't even need to switch out my Swallet at all. The combination of Light Screen and Swallet's special bulk was just too much for Wallace's Milotic to handle. Even without Light Screen, the Amnesias were more than enough to take on all these hits, and a crit would have still dealt less than half. Wallace finally goes down, giving us the 8th Gym Badge, and now it's just Wally and the Pokemon League to go. I cannot believe I made it this far in just the second attempt. This challenge was extremely difficult in the beginning, but definitely got much easier as the run progressed, especially after Watson. I would very much like to not go through all that early game again if I can help it, so I'll be preparing extra hard for Wally in the Pokemon League. With nothing really left to do at this point, besides preparing for the final challenges, I head over to Evergrande City, which I, I still don't understand why they call this place a city, but whatever, to take on Victory Road and Wally. After trekking through the darkness and pushing through all the little puzzles, I finally reach the end where I'll be facing off against my final boss before the Pokemon League, Wally. Leading with Starmie yet again. Don't worry, that's going to happen a lot. I'll be using him to wipe out Altaria and then whatever else it'll match up nicely against. Maybe Gardevoir if I need him to, but I doubt it. I'll explain why later. Maybe against Delcaddy and possibly Rosalia. Although Ice Beam is pretty unlikely to one-shot that Rosalia, unfortunately, and getting Giga Drain doesn't really sound all that pleasant, so maybe not, we'll see. Sableye makes a return to the team, specifically to deal with Wally's ace, Gardevoir. Sableye is immune to Psychic, and can just use Detect on turns in which Future Sight would hit. It doesn't matter how many times you double team or use Calm Mind when you can't actually hit me with anything. Grumpig is up next, and his special bulk and light screen will be very useful against Magneton, who I don't exactly have a great plan for. I left Muck and Weezing behind because I needed Delcaddy and Goldeen for the required HMs to get myself to this point. But hey, light screen will help a lot to reduce the damage of Thunderbolt, and then I'll just have to slam my face into it repeatedly until it hopefully dies. Swallet is nice to have for anyone outside of Gardevoir or Magneton. If I had kept Yawn up to this point, I could have used that against him, but I replaced it in favor of Rest for the Wallace fight. And I'm not going all the way back through this cave just so I can reteach him via hard scale. And finally we have Delcaddy. And yes, I said finally because Goldeen does not count and cannot be used in battle. Delcaddy is one of my HM slaves at this point, but I did give him Shockwave a while back and that could help against Gardevoir, I guess, if something goes horribly wrong with Sableye. Honestly, may not be bad against Rosalia either since it doesn't have a weakness to grass type moves. All right, even though I'm a couple members down from the A team, I think I should still have this one in the back. Let's see how it goes. Starmie comes out and quickly disposes of Altaria with a single Ice Beam. Delcaddy actually comes out next, which is kind of surprising. I thought for sure it would be either Rosalia or Magneton. And on top of that, a single non-crit Surf was actually enough to take it down in one hit. Starmie is just crazy good. Man, I, I don't know. That Rosalia does finally come out, and since I'm at full HP and my special defense is actually pretty good, I decided to go for the Ice Beam, and it actually kills. We had to hit a pretty close roll on that, I believe, and we got it. Starmie is still at full HP, which is amazing, but I'm not taking any chances with this Magneton, so I switch into Grumpig for this one. After a lot of back and forth featuring Light Screens, Calm Minds, Paralysis, and even a Rest to get all my health back, Magneton will eventually go down to a 
couple of psychics. I thought that was going to be more difficult, but luckily it wasn't. And come on, Wally. Super potions? What's wrong with you, man? His ace finally comes out, and I immediately switch into Sableye to wreak havoc on this Gardevoir. And I mean, really, like, it was, it was ugly. I wasn't kidding when I said there was just nothing it can do to us. He sets up a few double teams and then just gets clobbered by a few Shadow Balls anyway. I'm really glad I had Sableye for this fight, though, because that Gardevoir can be very scary without a Dark type on my team. Wally is finally finished, and now all that's left is the Pokemon League. I have really enjoyed this run so far, and I'm very looking forward to the final challenge ahead. I'll see you guys in a bit for one last team review. All leveled up and ready to go. The final push is here and I really hope I don't fuck it up now. It's no surprise that the best Pokemon on this team will have a very big impact on how this Pokemon League run goes. Starmie will be doing a lot of heavy lifting wherever it can. In fact, it will most likely contribute on every single fight, apart from maybe Phoebe's team. It will take out most of Sydney's team, it'll be a backup for Phoebe's team, which is where he'll see the least amount of action, I'll use it to take out Glacia Celios and possibly a Glalie, Drake's entire team, and Steven's Skarmory, Armaldo, and Agron, hopefully. At least that's the plan. Next up is Weezing, and Weezing has the most important job in the entire run, taking out Steven's Metagross with Destiny Bond. This will be a very tricky setup and will require a lot of coordination with the rest of my team for things to go into my favor. I'll also use him as an additional backup plan for Phoebe and to take out one of Glacia's Glalies as well with Flamethrower. Originally, I wasn't planning on bringing our starter with me, which would have been really sad because in all the runs I've done on my channel so far, I have not brought a single starter to the Pokemon League. Until now! The primary reason for bringing Muck is to deal with Glalie's ace, Walrein. Out of all the strategies I tried to come up with for that beast, brick breaking it just seemed like the best way to go, especially since it should be a two-hit KO. Muck will also deal with Sydney's Absol and will be another backup for Phoebe and maybe Steven as well. Crobat comes in with probably the least amount of assignments overall, but he does have some important matchups to help keep the rest of the team healthy. I'll use him primarily for Steven's Claydol, which is actually super important because none of my other team members can do this very clearly. Otherwise, Crobat will fill in the gaps on whichever fights he needs to. Our fifth team member is Grumpig, who will be very essential in a few areas. He is starting out with Reflect instead of Light Screen, and this is for Phoebe. I'm going to attempt to sweep her with Calm Mind and Psychic. It may not work as intended, but I do have a backup plan if he's not able to pull it off. After Phoebe, Grumpig will switch over to Light Screen for Glacia's Walrein, hopefully making it a lot easier for Muck to take it down. And last but not least, for what feels like the third playthrough in a row now, Swallet and his bulky self comes into play. Swallet is a backup on most fights, but will play an extremely critical role in helping to set up wheezing against Steven's Metagross. I believe I'll also need him to take out his crate Dilly as well, which will be tough to manage. The Steven fight is honestly going to be involve a lot of preparation and risk taking in general. And that's the team. Nothing more to do, nothing more to say. I'm excited to get started. Sydney's up first. Let's do this. I send Starmie out and oh my god, just like a rabid animal, it immediately starts laying waste to Sydney and his poor dark types. Poor guys didn't even stand a chance. Surf takes out Mighty Anna, Ice Beam, Cacturn, Thunderbolt, Sharpedo, and then when Absol came out, I got bored and really didn't want this to be a Starmie showcase, so I sent in Muck to dispose of both, both Absol and Shiftry. Not only did I make it out of this fight without any trouble, I didn't even take any damage, which might be a first for me, honestly. I mean, Sydney's easy, but shit, he's not usually that easy. Phoebe is up next, and I'm thinking this will be a little bit harder. I send in Grumpig first and quickly realize that my Calm Mind strategy is just not going to work here, as Dusclops does go for the curse eventually. So I decided to take it out with Psychic and move on to the backup plan. To be honest, if any of her ghost moves crit me anyway, I would have just been wasted. Better to be safe than sorry. Her next Banette is out, so I switch into Crobat to take it out. This was a tough choice to decide who to send out here next because I wasn't sure if this was the Banette with Psychic or not, since both of them are at the same level. I took the chance with Crobat and it paid off, as it wasn't the one with Psychic. After some back and forth, Banette gets low enough that Phoebe actually decides to go for a switch, which is definitely rare to see. Sableye comes out now, and Crobat immediately exerts a ton of pressure between Shadow Ball, Sludge Bomb, and Confuse Ray. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough to take Sableye out, and it does get a Psychic off, which did hurt a lot. But he was poisoned, and therefore brought it down at the end of the turn. Naturally, Phoebe then sends out her Banette that has Psychic, and knowing this, I switch into Starmie to take it. And since I'm already here, and Starmie is still drooling from its battle with Sydney, I just kept him in and aimed 
to finish off the rest of Phoebe's team with Surf. Shadow Ball did hit for a lot, which was very scary because a crit there would have ended Starmie and probably the entire run, honestly. So next time, maybe I'll just switch into something else. Yeah, because probably best not to risk my best Pokemon. And Phoebe's usually pretty easy anyway. And now we've got Glacia and her monster of a wall ring to deal with. Let's see how this goes. I lead with Weezing just to take out the first Glalie. Again with the risking my essential team members to crits. I really thought Weezing would hold up just a little bit better than that, but I guess not. Celio comes out and I switch into Starmie to start raining Thunderbolts on it. It took a few as it wasn't a one hit KO and Glacia did use a full restore on it, which is pretty good for us. Eventually it goes down though and her second Glalie Glalie comes out. I decide to see how much damage I can get in with Starmie before switching it out. I know this thing has crunch, but its stats aren't anything crazy and Starmie does have a great special bulk. Well, I was wrong yet again. Jesus, what the fuck am I doing with these damage calculations? Again, didn't seem like it would hit this hard. I definitely have to switch here, so I went with Swallet and threw out a Toxic. Realizing that Swallet has just such a huge special booty on him, I just keep him in to deal with the Glalie using Sludge Bombs. With the second one down, the other Celio comes out, and I confidently switch back into Starmie because I know nothing this Celio has can really do much of anything, even if it crits. After recovering up and using a few more Thunderbolts, Celio goes down as well, and then this big bad beauty of a Pokemon comes out to make Glacia's final stand. I switch into Grumpig to set up a light screen. Fuck me. I forgot to teach it to Grumpig before the fight. God damn it. You know what? Whatever. I don't care. I don't need it. I throw out a few Psychics to take quite a large chunk of damage out of Walrein, honestly. Much more than I thought it would be, but I did spend some more turns against him and therefore risked a bit more potential turns of sheer cold coming out. Muck finally comes out to finish the job, gets hit with a blizzard, gets frozen, but it doesn't matter. Muck defrosts immediately to hit the Brick Break and finish off Glacia once and for all. Jesus Christ, these battles are definitely getting more interesting now. Remember two seconds ago when I said these battles were starting to get more interesting? Well, this next one will not be. Drake's team is terrifying in both Sapphire and Emerald, except for the fact that he runs four Pokemon that have a quad weakness to ice. With how easily obtainable ice beams are in this generation, this fight is very often just a complete joke, especially if your ice beam user is fast. But even if you're not faster than anything, you'll still make it out pretty unscathed most of the time, as long as you've got those ice beams. If you don't have those ice beams, well then God help you, because because honestly, there's just so much firepower on this team. Would definitely become too overwhelming, but as you can see, Starmie clearly doesn't care about no Drake. And finally, it all comes down to this. Only Steven left, and I promise you, this will not be boring or easy. I actually decide to go with Weezing first here because I don't really need Weezing to be at full HP for Metagross. What I did not expect was to open up with a crit on Skarmory, killing it without taking any damage at all. That's absolutely huge for us. With Claydol out, I switch into Crobat. This is your time to shine, buddy. Take that bastard out. I set up Confuse Ray and start using Flies instead of Shadow Balls until the Reflect wears off. It worked out great for Crobat, and the Confusion put in a lot of work, and we took very little damage in the process. Claydol eventually goes down, and now Cradilly comes out. I'm expecting the super scary Ancient Power to come out, but with enough HP on Crobat, I slip in another Confuse Ray to help Muck take this thing down. I realized right before the fight that Muck would just be better suited to deal with this Cradilly instead of Swallet, who I would need close to fully healthy for Metagross. Muck doesn't run into any issues whatsoever, and Cradilly goes down. Very lucky that none of those Ancient Powers got the boost. I have been so fortunate so far in this fight. Agron comes out and I know the earthquake is coming, so I pivot through Weezing first and then go into Starmie. Agron went for Thunder anyway, but it missed. Oh man, am I truly blessed by Arceus today. Holy crap. I mean, like Thunder would not have done a crazy amount of damage anyway, just because of how low Agron's special attack is, but having a healthy Starmie against Steven's remaining Pokemon is extremely clutch here. Agron goes down and then Armaldo comes out, only to get wrecked by another Surf. And now it's just Metagross left. And you know what? Fuck it. It's his ace versus mine now. Let's see what happens. It's not like I have to save Starmie for anything else at this point. There's nothing left to lose. And for reasons I will never, ever, ever, ever understand, this Metagross used Psychic and Psychic only for the rest of the fight. I am truly and utterly baffled by this. I mean, Meteor Mash may have been comparable, maybe? But both Earthquake and Hyper Beam were clearly superior options that would have caused major issues for my superstar. 
But honestly, with how incredible this attempt was, maybe it was just meant to be. Maybe this is exactly how it should have played out. Originally planning on sacrificing three Pokemon to remove Metagross from the field, but instead, we end this run with everyone who worked so hard and overcame so much alive. Every single one of them made it through the league, and I couldn't be more happy about how everything turned out. And with that, this video is now over. I very much enjoyed the challenges that this run gave me, and I was especially pleased with the Pokemon that I got to use. I hope you guys enjoyed the run as well. Looking forward to what's next. In the meantime, please like the video and subscribe for more content like this. That's it for me. I'll see you next time.